Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 218. On today's show, we talk about three recent dramatic situations in the archaeology world. Let's dig a little deeper, but don't forget to tell the new king or he'll have you hanged. (laughs) All right, welcome to the show, everybody. How's it going? Good. We're in not-so-sunny Oceanside, California. (laughs) (laughs) Not today. Not today. It's been beautiful here, though. We used to live in a condo building in downtown Reno. Mm -hmm. And that building had a pool that was open, I want to say like 24 hours a day. It wasn't 24 hours a day, but it was like 6 a.m. to midnight or something. Yeah, it had a broad hour. Very broad. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the last time I could remember swimming consistently. Mm -hmm. But here, we're across the little park street Mm -hmm. from the swimming pool and we've gone, except for today so far, literally every day this week that we've been Even just for like a quick like hot tub pop in. And I mean, the main reason I I feel like we're going as opposed to other parks because we've been to a lot of parks that have pools, but being able to see it and know that it's not full of people and super crowded makes you much more likely to go, I think. (laughs) Exactly. So let's talk about that in context of our first story, because being able to take a train out to some some archaeological resources are more than likely going to make people go see them rather than hiding them in the jungle. Yeah. Turning it into a (laughs) Disneyland style park is definitely the way to go. I think they just said Disneyland style train, but you know, (laughs) Disneyland has good trains. Uh Uh-huh. So we're talking about this first article. It's called What Was Behind the Protest Against an Archaeologist at Last Week's LA Times Book Festival. And this article was written by Alejandro Macial, who is the editorial director for the Los Angeles Times and Espanol. Yeah. And We have some opinions on this, which we'll get to in a minute, but it does seem like he is a well-respected, established journalist in L.A., and he actually invited Richard Hansen to come to this book festival and speak. So that's that kind of the context. And this article is almost written from like a an editorial perspective a little bit. Like there's a lot of I did this and we did that and that kind of thing in the article, too. So. That's yep. where it's coming from. We should kind of like lay the groundwork here because Richard Hansen yeah. is the archaeologist that you're mentioning in the title. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And he has been working in the uh, what's called the El Mirador region in the pit and jungle of Guatemala, which borders Mexico for a long time mm-hmm. as an archaeologist down there. There's a lot of archaeologists in, in this country and even in other countries, like not just Mexico, Guatemala and those countries, but like foreign archaeologists that work a lot down in that area. In fact, one of the hosts of one of our other podcasts works in Belize yeah. and he has for 20 years. There's a lot of archaeologists in the States that work outside of the country. It's pretty common practice for academic institutions to send archaeologists outside of the country. But not only outside the country, but down there specifically. Like Mayan stuff has always been hot and it's almost a little cliche. Like I I remember saying a long time ago, like somebody told me they're like, oh, you can't you can't swing a trowel at the SAAs without hitting a Mayanist <laughs> or, a, or somebody who's been to Belize. Right. Right. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of like a huge thing to go down there. It's close, but it's incredibly foreign at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's it's difficult to understand sometimes because of the jungle and there's, you know, things that are obvious and right there, but then hidden behind 60 feet of jungle yeah. at the same time. There's like a lot to study and a lot yeah. to learn about the Mayan culture specifically. So I think it does attract a lot of yeah. American archaeologists. So, yeah. Yeah. This guy, Richard Hansen, his his team and, and research people have used LIDAR, which a lot of people have in the jungle because, mm-hmm. again, the jungle's hard to find stuff in. Yeah. But they've used LIDAR to find over 964 archaeological sites. And what they're saying, they're calling 417 cities. I don't know what their definition of city necessarily right. is. Where does mm-hmm. that threshold lie? Yeah. Connected by a complex network of roads, which I totally believe all that because mm-hmm. that fits with pretty much everywhere else we've looked for Mayan civilization. I mean, they were just at the peak and they yeah. were, you know, building things and had millions of people that, yeah. that part of their society, you know, through hundreds of years. And yeah, there was just a lot going on there. Yeah, definitely. 
So according to Hansen, the sites that he has uncovered and worked on are threatened by illegal activity, and that can include poaching, logging, and drug and human trafficking. So all kinds of stuff going on in the jungle, according to him. And his team wanted to figure out how to, and this is in quotes, protect El Mirador without falling into the hands of the big interests that roam the area. And we believe that the best way to do that is by declaring it a bi-national natural sanctuary. End quote. <laughs> yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, he doesn't mean our nation. He means Guatemala and Mexico. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Richard Hansen came from Guatemala to be part of the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books on the USC campus on April 23rd, 2023. That's what we were talking about in the beginning. Yeah. And the article's author, Alejandro Maciel, invited him. And it was to discuss his research so that the locals including the local Mayan community in LA could learn about his research. That was yeah. the goal there. However, right at the beginning of the conversation, I think it was like three minutes in the article mentioned a group of masked demonstrators claiming to be Mayan. And this is the language I'm getting from the article written by Alejandro. Alejandro. Mm -hmm. So, a group of mass demonstrators claiming to be Mayan rushed to the stage, seized microphones, threw chairs, knocked over loudspeakers, and even hit one of the stage crew. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of violent. Probably sounding. hit one of the stage crew with like a chair or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Jerry Springer style. Yeah. Yeah. Rest in peace, Jerry Springer. Anyway, <laughs> the demonstrators even held up a banner that read, Gringo Colonizer Fuera del Mirador. Right. So they were accusing Hansen of trying to appropriate the cultural heritage of the Guatemalan people to basically turn a profit personally because this sanctuary that he's talking about building is according to them it's more of an archaeological theme park which does sound a little bit dramatic when you put it that way yeah like it's not going to be like an indiana jones style theme park but <laughs> spare no expense <laughs> look okay we've got more to talk about here but let's just say that on both sides of this argument there's a lot of drama <laughs> yeah and that's why we called this episode archaeology drama because this is high drama in this world i also wouldn't like technically say no to an archaeology theme park <laughs> I mean, I want it to be done in the right way, but like, I'd be pretty excited to go I mean, a there. fully manufactured one that's just meant to be fun, yes. Not necessarily manufactured even, but something that, you know, allows you to go in and experience places the way that they maybe were, you it's know? It's just hard to find that it, line between doing that and also preservation and protection, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, it's tough to do. Yeah. I mean, the nuts and bolts of this story are Hansen denies that those accusations. He said, he says that's the opposite of what he wants to do. He, he feels that... By investing in the area and putting in, you know, like a light rail to get in there. That's what I was talking about mm -hmm. at the beginning and, and basically making access better to it, that you would help drive out the negative influences that he says are there, which are like mm -hmm. the mafia, the crime, the drugs. Some people were interviewed that are hired to basically watch the area mm -hmm. by the government of Guatemala. They say that they routinely see planes flying over and pushing drugs out the window and because that's where they're being dropped off uh -huh. right? and then they're going and picking them up and doing things like that and they say it's just it's all crazy and Hansen is saying that well yeah if we put some money in this thing not like capital investment but if we put some money in this thing and we turn it into a place like I'm thinking Chichen Itza when I think of him saying this kind of things I mean Chichen Itza has a flood of tourists coming into it and we were one of those tourists coming in mm -hmm. and out and I feel like that's actually probably good for the Mayan community there you know to learn about them we had Mayan guides mm -hmm. that, that taught us all about this stuff so I think that's where he's trying to go but there's of course his way of doing it and the fact that he's him is part of what's causing all this controversy yeah, and it it's also like the location of the site too. the The current access to the area is basically by helicopter. Yeah, and it's a three day walk in, which is why this whole light rail idea has been proposed. But you know, it begs the question though: like, why why are we trying to make it commercially available when it's so remote? You have to put a lot of infrastructure into it in order to make it accessible. Yeah. So, like, is that really the best choice for? this archaeological resource, not even talking about the communities and the natural resources around it that are going to be affected by this. But, you know, like something that's that far away and that remote, I just don't know if it's, I don't know. Yeah. Another thing he says is that it would help generate jobs. This infrastructure would have to be maintained, of course. Mm -hmm. It would have to be run by somebody and it would be run by the local Guatemalan government, which a lot of people are still even Mayan there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would be running this and he says it would generate a lot of jobs and, and which inherently brings money into the area as well mm -hmm. i mean again on our little trip to chichen itza they dropped us off at a mayan like yeah. town thing 
That was such a gimmick. <laughs> it was. It was. But these were people who were living in that area selling stuff for outrageous prices to white people. Yeah. And we bought them. Yeah. And, you know, gave them some money. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why we spent as much we, as we did on certain things. Because mm-hmm. we're like, well, I know where this money's going. It's not going to China. Mm-hmm. You know, not that China doesn't need money. But yeah. <laughs> not in that way. Right. So, yeah. So this proposal has definitely earned him many attacks from his enemies, verbal attacks and, and you know, death threats. So, and there's, it's more than just him talking about doing this too, because this plan for the light rail and then bringing like ecotourism, he calls it to this area. He's, he's trying to, or he was trying to push it through with a bill in the Senate. It was S.3131. And he had bipartisan support from both Republicans and Democrats to get it pushed through. And I think it did fail recently. It yeah, he had some support, but apparently not enough. Yeah, not yeah. enough, for sure. It didn't make it through. Yeah. But the question, again, for me, is why is he trying to push a bill in the U.S. Senate to get money for archaeological resources in Guatemala? I didn't even know you really could do that unless it yeah. was for like humanitarian aid or something. If, unless he's pushing it on those grounds, right. which is maybe why it failed, because they're like, this isn't like, humanitarian. Yeah. yeah. And there's archaeologist Francisco Estrada Belli was like, what do you expect when you try to fund your plan through the back door by introducing a bill in the U.S. Senate right. and subverting the locals, which is kind of what we're just saying. Like, why why are you trying to use the U.S. government to get money <laughs> for this project? It's right. It's crazy. But of course, every argument, you can find people to support you on both sides. And Hansen was like, well, the negotiations in the Senate included 13 Guatemalan representatives and their minister of culture. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I mean... There's a lot of places in a lot of countries that that experience a, a high level of corruption in some places. And I'm not saying the Ministry of Culture is corrupt, mm-hmm. but it might be in their best interest to do this, but maybe not in the people who live there's best interest mm-hmm. to do this. So it's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. So that is sort of where the article that we originally found about this story ends, right? And it did leave us with a lot of questions like... What is the other side of the story? Because this article I felt was very like supportive and kind of apologetic of Hansen and him and what his motives are. And we're trying to like validate and justify them. And I was like, well, what's the other side? Right. So there's we found this other article and this was written in 2020. It was right when this bill was first proposed. So it's a little a couple of years older. But it had a great backstory for what the actual relationship is between Hansen and Guatemala and the communities in the area that he is trying to affect. It begins like 30-ish years ago. Well, not not really. It begins way before that. But <laughs> we're going to start the story about 30-ish years ago in 1990. So there, the deforestation was on the rise and Guatemala realized it needed to do something to protect the jungles. So it created the Mayan Biosphere Reserve to, you know, to protect the jungles. And as you might imagine, there were communities that lived in that area that were affected by the government just saying, well, this is now a reserve. (laughs) (laughs) So they created a compromise where any communities living within the reserve were able to apply for what they called a concession that would allow them to continue living their way of life within the jungle, within those boundaries. I know it does kind of sound like a reservation a little bit, doesn't it? But it's not yeah. quite like that. They are not separate entities. They they don't govern themselves. They just are allowed right. to do things in the forest that other other people and other groups are not allowed to do because they 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 have been given this reserve. But it's not just a hey, go do whatever you want in the jungle permission. It's it's responsible harvesting of the tropical woods, latex, and other products that they have harvested. F- for the entirety that their communities have lived in that area. I wonder but who responsible judges. is the key word here. Yeah, I'm wondering who dictates what responsible means. Yeah, and that's probably one of Hansen's problems with these communities, but we'll get there. Carmelita is the community that is closest to the El Mirador area, and they have had one of these concessions in place for the past 25 years. And... Th- through their efforts, the rate of deforestation in that area is far lower than it is in other places that don't have the same protections and that don't have a community nearby helping to manage it. And, 
you might wonder how is there deforestation happening when these areas are supposed to be protected? Well, that would be the illegal stuff Mm -hmm. that Hanson and other people are concerned about. There's still illegal deforestation going on all over the place. So, but because they're there and they're protecting this area, any, any removal of anything from the jungle is happening under this concession that they have. And, through their efforts, the deforestation is lower and they've also helped to like maintain forest cover, which is super important for jungles to maintain their ecosystem. And they've also suffered fewer forest fires. So like objectively from the outside, what this community has done has has been an improvement to the the ecosystem of the area. And honestly, that's in direct contrast to what Hansen says about this community specifically and any community that has the concession. Has he said it specifically about this community? Yeah. Or just this, like overall? In this article, he does target Carmelita specifically yeah. because they are the ones that are nearest to the area that he works in. Okay. And if you want even more evidence of how what they're doing is working, these communities, there's there's a recent study where they looked at the year 2017 and they measured the number of fires that took place. Mm-hmm. And basically only 1% of all the fires in the whole reserve happened in the the community forest concessions, which were managed by these different groups of people. Yeah, And and they only make up 16% of the total land the of, the, of the reserve. Yeah. yeah. So they're doing a really good job of making sure that fires don't happen. And fires happen because of deforestation. You get these open, clear areas and then, you know, it's easier to burn and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. So, so that's like, you know, objective evidence that what they're doing is working. And now here is where I think that Hanson might be having a, a large problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Carmelita, in addition to the work it's done, you know, in conservation, it has also created and grown its own tourism cooperative to provide guided expeditions to the archaeological sites. Mm. And they started this community-led tourism in 2013, and it has really grown, and it has really helped to attract more people to the area. And because it's community-led tourism, 90% of the community benefits directly from it through jobs, equipment rentals, animals, all that kind of stuff. And that is what they call a sort of bottom-up model of tourism, where the people that live in the area are the ones who are benefiting from them. And it does seem to be working very well. I could see some holes in it. Like maybe they're not as great at tourism as they want to be. Maybe it's not a great experience for the people who are going on the tours. Are they being safe? Are they following the right rules? Like there's a lot of stuff that you have to get right when you're talking about leading an expedition for three days by foot into the jungle. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) But Hopefully they are, and I don't have information on on how well that is going from that perspective. Hansen, on the other hand, is proposing the top-down tourism idea, which is funded with big money. He wants to build large hotels, this light rail thing, this Disneyland-style light rail. So that... I think the whole Disneyland thing is clouding the whole issue It is. I mean, it's dramatic. I get that, but... I mean, it's kind of what it is, though. It's a rail into the jungle so that people don't have to walk there. Yeah, sure. You know? It's. It seems like this is the kind of tourism that's built for the elite, by the elite, and the people running it will be people that aren't from the local communities. Car- the people of Carmelita are like, we're going to just watch the tourists go right by us and we're not going to make any money off of them like we currently are now. Yeah. Don't they deserve to make money off of tourism in their own area, an area that they are shepherding? Yeah, I suppose. So, and back to Hanson again. He he does not feel that the forest concessions that these communities have, that they are doing a good job of protecting the jungle. Right. The, the work that they have done, he doesn't feel like it is good enough. And he, he's kind of, for the last 20 years, sort of been attacking that entire structure that the government of Guatemala created to try to to deconstruct them. And he's made at least four attempts since 2000 to get legislation passed that would annul these concessions and to help bring in the legislation that he wants, you know, to build these larger tourism things in the jungle. So anyway, and he also has some relationships with economic and political elite in Guatemala. So he's got support from people that are higher up. I'm not going to say anybody's corrupt, but like there could be (laughs) some of that going on. And 
nothing that he's proposed so far has passed, including both in Guatemala and most recently in the United States. So obviously it's kicking up warning flags for people. Okay, yeah. so there's the other side of the story. I feel like we've got two really black and white situations. One side, Hansen is the devil. The other side, he just wants to like, you know, bring tourism to the people in a way that is good. What do you think? <laughs> Well, I, it's hard to say. I mean, we don't want to put words in his mouth or anybody else's mouth, though. But it does seem like in my experience with, you know, people that get really passionate about an area that they study. This is the thing about academics, right? They go and they, they really focus on one area. Even if that area is a million square mile jungle, mm-hmm. they focus on one area for their entire careers. Mm-hmm. And literally everything is built on it. And it's one of the... I think fundamental problems of academia and why things don't change very often because when you find somebody building their entire career, their books, their literature, their 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 reports, their papers they've written, everything off of one thing. Yeah. And then somebody tries to either tear that down or, you know, in some cases disprove your theories or do something else or come up with something else. You see it as a wasted career. Yeah, and they so, get like territorial almost over exactly. what they see as their corner of yeah. the academic world or something like that. Right. And yeah. I, have, I have no doubt that this started in Hansen's mind a long time ago, 20, 30 years ago, mm-hmm. as, you know, a young academic where you're you're told to interact with the local communities and give something back to them. That's what universities say when they give you funding to do these things. They're like, that. great, go do the archaeology. But then what are you going to do for the community that you're working in? Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes it has nothing to do with archaeology. Sometimes it's helping them get clean water. Sometimes it's helping them build a school. Sometimes it's, you know, whatever. But mm-hmm. you're, you're giving back to the community that you're taking things from. And it probably started that way with him starting to look, okay, well, what can we do to, you know, to give back? And, you know, maybe we can open up these archaeological resources. Maybe we can do these things. And then I think what I want to do would actually protect the archaeology better than what they're doing. And it probably started with him looking at the archaeology first and the people second. Yeah. And the kind people don't want to be second. There. Yeah. Right. And now he is, he is, sitting on this and he's been doing it for so long he probably doesn't know how to do anything else Mm -hmm. and he's just like i gotta push this through otherwise in his mind it's going to destroy everything yeah and all the all the history and there's no other way to manage it yeah and it does seem like there's like a lot of gray here because it it's just it's never it's so much more nuanced than just one person good one person bad you know and i think you're right i think he probably first just wanted to like share something with the world that he thought was amazing and wonderful and he wanted to give a window to it for more people and to protect it too but the thing is is that you're supposed to do that in conjunction with the local communities and the local people and make sure that they're not left out of this conversation or this equation or if there's money out of the the pocketbook you know like they the local people are just as important in this. And it seems like maybe he tried in the beginning and it went bad. And now ever since then, he's been trying to bypass them. I'm not really sure like where the relationship went badly, but it is clear that right now it is not a good relationship. It's very adversarial, like accusing each other. I'm not even going to say some of the things that either side have sure. accused uh, each other of. Like, it's just, you're getting into this like tit for tat situation, which doesn't help anybody. It's just gets bad there. So, but it does, it does seem like there has to be like some sort of middle ground where they can meet. I'm not sure a light rail out to <laughs> to the archaeological I, sites is the right choice, but maybe I 100 disagree with that because because <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> no, because you're you're making it so that the only people that can go experience this archaeology, the ones that can pack three days into the jungle. What about well, people who are disabled? What about children? What about fair what about elderly? Fair, but you're t- talking about a light rail. Do you think that's going to be cheap? You're cutting out a whole other percentage of the pop- population that can't afford to get on this expensive light oh, rail to go out to it. Those are you always know? cheap. I mean, once you get it built, I can take one to San Diego right now for $10. That's right? this country. We're talking about Guatemala. I understand that, so. but other other countries, like they have so many more trains than we do. I'm, I'm not worried about the train being expensive. I, I would very worry very much about that. I can and imagine hiring a guide for three days is probably more expensive than a train. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it There's a lot of things to consider. I just think that there has to be a happy middle ground. It doesn't need to be one or the other. Maybe it's both. Maybe you do offer both options somehow i don't know maybe it's making the helicopter option more accessible i i don't know what it is but but it does seem like that these two groups are very far apart right now and 
I don't think anybody is going to be able to move forward at all until they find some way to work together. But of course, there is the whole question of why is he even involved in the politics of the area at all? Oh. He's American and he's not authorized to do anything there except work on the archaeological resources. It doesn't so matter. He's, he's emotionally invested in the place. He is. He you is. Know? But, you know, there's yeah. there's that, too. You have to as a white person who's not from the culture and from the area, you would think that you'd step back and like kind of look at your actions and how you're yeah. engaging with the local people in the local communities and make sure that you're doing it in a way that is not offensive or, or bad. But anyway, also, they've lost track of that. I think I <laughs> one more thing about a light rail, I think also would be less damaging on the uh, surrounding. That jungle. it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Because light rails are permanently fixed. They don't move around. Yeah. You know, anytime we've driven out in the desert and we see a low spot in a road where it gets muddy, what do you see around that low spot in the road? You see people driving around it and making their own roads, mm -hmm. right? So roads just get wider and wider and wider and they get all over the place. And I can't imagine it's any different in the jungle. The jungle grows back every year, so it's kind of self-healing. Mm -hmm. But as people are going out there, they want to have their paths. I'm sure these guides have hacked machete paths through the jungle to be able to get through there, especially if they're actually taking tourists. Mm -hmm. And that's just like, are they always going the same way? Are they are they really strict about making a trail and, and not going off that trail? For sure. Know. It's but like it's like building a boardwalk. Boardwalks are destructive ultimately, but once they're established, everything just grows around it. Yeah, and I guess that becomes my question though, is like why can't the money that Hansen and others are trying to bring into this area, why can't that money be used to develop what the local community has already established? This sort of three day adventure into the jungle backpacking kind of thing. Now, yeah, that might, that, that might not be everybody's <laughs> cup of tea, but you know, if you make it better then more people will be able to do it. Maybe you, you have donkeys that you can ride all the way in and out. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to walk that whole way, you know, there's ways that, that what they're currently doing could be improved and made better and therefore more accessible to more people. It doesn't have to be big money from the top down doing it in, in that way that's it's true I don't know it doesn't just, have to be but it's usually quicker yeah, yeah yeah but in the end it's gotta be a conversation between all the people involved and right now they're trying to take each other out of the conversation mm -hmm. and I don't think it's going very well for, for either yeah. of them all right well let's go ahead and take a break and on the other side we'll talk about how Netflix is building a metaphorical racist light rail through Egypt <laughs> back in a minute <laughs> Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy. Zaxby's. Welcome back to episode 218 of the Archaeology Show. And now we're going to talk about Netflix and their drama. And again, <laughs> how people are throwing metaphorical chairs at their Netflix <laughs> accounts. It's a docudrama okay yeah sure <laughs> so anyway there is a series that just debuted the week before you're hearing this mm -hmm. if you're we're listening to this in real time yeah so it's on netflix right now yeah and it's a docudrama again called queen cleopatra and it's in a series that is all about african queens mm -hmm. there have been a lot of very interesting very powerful african queens in the past not just in egypt all over the place mm -hmm. and there's a lot of interesting stories to be told there this one happens to be about cleopatra and one of the biggest controversies here we'll just get it right off the bat is that Egyptian nationalists are a little upset that Cleopatra is being represented by a black woman, Adele James. She's a, is she actually British? She is British. Okay, she's I British. Believe. Yeah. That's the other thing I just like, we watched the first episode of this, it's like four. Yeah. And like, everybody has British accents. I was like, <laughs> is this a movie from the 60s? Seriously? I know. Like, you, the, nobody gives them British accents anymore. <laughs> Make them subtitled and have them learn Egyptian. Right. You know, I yeah. mean, come on. I that, mean, the, uh, Arabic is what they speak now, but I don't know what they spoke in Cleopatra's time. Actually, Cleopatra probably spoke Latin. Yeah, probably. Or Greek. Probably. Yeah. I feel like that kind of stuff is really hard to get right. And you kind of just have to go with whatever accent the, the actors have, you know. And but, but if you're OK with that, you should be OK with bending colors of actors because everybody's inclusive these days. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And but we're not. Egypt's and definitely not in e this situation. Egypt's not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. They may have had their Arab Spring, but. 
<laughs> they haven't come into the fall yet, apparently. There's a whole thing going on here, though. And there's people who were for this mm -hmm. and people who are against this. The people yeah. who are for this episode and the way it's being done or this series are called Afrocentrists, basically. And there's a lot of Afrocentrists in Africa uh -huh. and outside of Africa, of course, but definitely in Africa. Yeah. And they are saying that there's a lot of African heritage that is just being clouded over, you know, in, mm -hmm. in Africa and, and it's being obscured. And they're saying this is a nod to African heritage. And they're saying, oh, yeah, sure. Cleopatra was black. Why not? Right. That's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And they're going for it. But Egyptians are saying that this is one more thing that Afrocentrists are doing to tear down Egyptian heritage. Right. And they, the article that we read was saying uh, they started with Jewish slaves building the pyramids, which was a theory that I don't think anybody really believes anymore. Then, of course, aliens yeah. and now black Africans yeah. uh, building the. Now, I. I wouldn't doubt that there was probably some slaves that built some pyramids, but it's mm -hmm. been pretty well known, too, that actual Egyptian workers built pyramids. Right. Like it was a job. Yeah. You know, it was like a, a skill almost. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not saying they had a great time doing it and they probably didn't have OSHA, but, you know, <laughs> it was it was it was something it was that they skilled did. labor, basically, that yeah, they were paid at, for. Yeah. You look at all the graves and, and cemeteries that we found and, and these areas where these these generation workers, because sometimes it would take, you know, 20, 30, yeah. 40 mm -hmm. years or more to build a pyramid. So you've got generations of people doing this. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something that's relatively sustainable. Yeah. Well, back to Cleopatra, her lineage is actually really well documented. She was the last descendant of Greek colonizers, and she probably had Greek features. And we can see this from the queens and other artifacts from the time period. Yeah, her face is represented on a lot of stuff. Yeah, and, and we know her lineage because we know who her father was, and we know kind of what he looked like as well. I think we aren't quite as sure about her mother and what her mother would have looked like. At least that's how they're representing it in the documentary. So most people think that she probably was not black because we know she's a descendant of Greeks on her father's side. Mm -hmm. And most people agree that she probably wasn't black for that reason. But I guess because of the question mark over her mother's heritage, the door is left open a little bit for exactly what percentage of black right. she is. Gosh, this whole thing actually starts so silly when start sounding like almost silly when you start talking about it. Like yeah. how does it even really matter? Like how dark her skin was or how not dark, <laughs> but it does re really matter very much to some people in the world. Yeah. And it matters a lot to Egyptians because yeah. they, they really do feel like this is taking their history down and sin and taking it away from them mm -hmm. by not having somebody that's the same color that they are right now. Yeah. Cause I mean, Egyptians, I mean, they're largely of like Middle Eastern and Arab descent yeah. right now. You know, people who have moved in in that area, they're not necessarily Africans in the sense of the the communities and the cultures that, you know, grew up in Africa. Yeah. They, they essentially moved in. But it was a long time ago that they did that. Yeah. And there was something I read in this article that I actually wrote down in the notes that I'm not sure how they know. Because mm -hmm. they say DNA, DNA studies show that Cleopatra shared no DNA with South Saharan Africans and that she descended from the Macedonian dynasty that ruled Egypt for almost 300 years. But I'm reasonably certain we've never found Cleopatra's grave. I don't think we have. So no. I'm not sure how I'm they know sure. that. Now, no. do we have one of her siblings? Because they would have the same genetic makeup, presumably. Uh, yeah. Assuming they have the same mother, which is actually probably not the greatest assumption. Right. So, or one, um, of their, one of her kids, maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe, but... I think without her actual remains, that would be hard to say for sure. But yeah, I believe she was. I mean, she was buried with Antony, Antony and Cleopatra's tomb. It would people think that that's what they were doing? You know, they think it was near Alexandria, Egypt. Mm -hmm. But from what I understand, it's never been found. And just doing yeah. a quick little Google search here, I don't think that it has ever been found. Yeah, there would be something pretty significant on here saying yeah. it was. So, not really sure where they're getting that information. But they must have another family relation. Yeah. Of hers that they feel like they can extrapolate yeah. that information over to her as well. So, Well, what would make some of the Egyptians happy, according to the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, is to just reclassify the show as a drama, not as a documentary. Yeah, but that's the thing, though, is it is very much a documentary. We watched the first episode just to kind of see what it was like and what was mm -hmm. going on. And it is very much presented as a documentary. And they have experts on there. They have... Interviews. Yeah, they, they interview them. They have, you know, people sitting and having questions asked to them. And they're answering these questions. One of them is even the vintage Egyptologist who is super big on Instagram and she is an actual like Egyptologist, Egyptologist too. Yeah. So like they've got some real true experts on there 
both in the social sphere <laughs> and also in the academic sphere with with those people. So yeah, and that woman mm-hmm. was actually interviewed on Tea Break Time Travel. She was. It was a great podcasts. interview. Yeah, yeah definitely so, go listen to her. Yeah, check that out where you, wherever you find podcasts or at arcpodnet.com forward slash tea break. Yeah, back to that. I mean, it is definitely a documentary. They, they have presented it as a documentary. Now they do have these little snippets of drama mixed in Mm -hmm. and it's cool i i don't know like i always loved the drama bits of the history documentaries that you used to watch like back in the day i love the reenactments that was always my favorite part so to go in on it harder with a show like this and have more drama and like more little in between bits of acting i love it i thought i thought that part was really great (laughs) and well done you know yeah so now cleopatra lived well over 2000 years ago but in the early like 40s 60s in that first century of mm-hmm. the of the first millennium AD basically or CE I should say mm-hmm. and the interesting thing about that is that is that is right I mean, right smack dab in the middle of and, and and right at the end of a certain period of colonialism that we mentioned at the beginning here and one of the things I did take away from an article that I read about this is an author wondering why Egyptians are so fiercely protecting the history of colonization is really what they're protecting. And yeah. it's not even necessarily like, I guess it is the current Egyptians. It is kind of their own history. Yeah. But it's also, you know, he mentioned that they've experienced nearly 2,400 years of uninterrupted colonization. Mm-hmm. Like people from the Greeks and Romans and all around have just come in and it's mostly yeah. them, to be honest with you, yeah. have just come in and, and maintained this, this, this dominion over Egypt yeah. you know, for a long time. But they like some of them better than others. Like I think Napoleon occupied Egypt for a little while and they hate yeah. Napoleon. They're not interested in, right. you know, having him as part of their history. <laughs> but Cleopatra, on the other hand, she did a really good job of making herself look Egyptian and be be a, an, as Egyptian as everybody else, right? Yeah. So, and they show that in the show too, that like her goal was to be one of the people and the, and the people loved her for it and people today, 2,000 years later, still love her. So I think, I think they can, you can kind of understand why, even though technically her lineage was colonizers, basically, mm-hmm. that by the time they got to Cleopatra, she was Egyptian and they loved her for it. And I, I think that's that's totally great, you know. Yeah. But the question still comes down to and what the question of the show kind of is, is was she black or not? And most of the evidence shows that she probably was not Adele James, the actress playing her, is. Yeah. She's also not been super sympathetic. On Twitter, she said, if you don't like the casting, don't watch the show, which is not exactly like having a dialogue about it or encouraging conversation. Mm-hmm. The the shutdown thing is not, not really going to help resolve anything. But mm. Yeah, she's speaking from a privileged position of an actor and not yeah. really looking at the people who are impacted by this show yeah you know and she she acted in the show she wasn't giving documentary evidence she was part of the acting side of it she's acting so when you you call it a docudrama they have people in there that are on the docu side of that yeah and people in there that are on the drama side of that and she's on the drama side and from her point of view yeah sure she's probably right yeah you don't like it don't watch it yeah but when you throw in the documentary aspect of it and you're presenting it as fact as information then it's you know it's problematic if you're if your facts are unsupported and like how many people are looking at this and being like oh i didn't know cleopatra is black and maybe not taking the first i don't know what was it like two minutes of that first episode where they talked about whether or not she was black if they didn't take that part in and just came away from that series thinking cleopatra was black like mm-hmm. you're li- you're missing a whole nuance of the colonization by people yeah. from greece and she was probably mixed race if she yeah. was if she was at all and and there's just a lot of nuances there that get lost when with this argument and this conversation. And I think that's where the Egyptian people are getting so mad about it and why they're getting so mad about it. Well, it's interesting. Again, going back to their history of colonization, another thing that one of the articles mentioned was that they even mourned the death of Queen Elizabeth II, even though four years into her reign, she waged war on Egypt during the Suez crisis. (laughs) And it's just... You know, the guy even said that they have somewhat of a Stockholm syndrome, like national identity, where they grow to love their colonizers for the past 2,000 plus years. It is an interesting relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
you know, it doesn't matter who you are. If they had found any sort of coins or anything like that and Queen Elizabeth knew about it and they didn't report it, well, she'd take their ass to jail. We'll talk about that on the other side. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. All right, welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 218. Not a docudrama. <laughs> Not even really a docu, to be honest with you. I guess we kind of are. <laughs> Kind of. There's a little bit of drama, though, too. Well, we present information, whether it's right or wrong, it's not always. <laughs> I mean, we try to figure it out. Sometimes you just can't tell. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard. <laughs> anyway, this one's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. The article is titled, Metal Detectorists Face Years in Jail for Trying to Sell 766,000 British Pounds of Ninth Century Anglo-Saxon Coins. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit on what's going on here. These guys were basically found guilty of hatching an illegal plot to sell these coins, right? They're yeah. of historical significance, and it says they may face imprisonment. Wait till the end of the article to find out if they may face imprisonment. <laughs> this is a breaking news story. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> With updates as we go. <laughs> Honestly, this week. Yeah. So the coins, again, valued at 766,000 pounds. That is equivalent to about 958,000 U.S. dollars. The... Coins were believed to have been buried probably by a Viking. I'm mm -hmm. not sure why Viking would have buried that many coins. And there's only uh, 44 of them, I think, when we get down to it. It's like a small hoard, basically, right? Well, there's like, more to it. Yeah. That's only one part of this Herefordshire hoard that was found, oh, okay. which we'll get into in a minute. Yeah. But the coins, again, there's only like 44 of them. So it's they might not even have been worth like a fortune back when they were buried. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like ninth century, the 800s. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if you find something, whether you're a metal detectorist or not, but metal mm -hmm. detectorists in particular have really expanded across the English landscape because first off, there is a lot of metal history mm -hmm. in England. Yeah. I mean, centuries and centuries and centuries of swords, coins, yep. mm -hmm. you know, clothing items, all kinds of stuff that you can pick out with a metal detector. And as metal detectors have gotten cheaper and more advanced to see deeper into the ground, and then especially after the BBC show called The Detectorists, Oh, like about popular. metal detecting? It's about metal detectors. <laughs> people that are doing it. Yeah. People are just like, hell, I can do that. Mm -hmm. There's lots of stuff here. Yep. Well, since all that is kind of going down, they really need to follow the rules, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know how well publicized these are, but I'm willing to bet it's think, not a huge secret. I don't think it is. I think most yeah. people know what these rules are. They, they've been in place for yeah. a long time from what I understand. So well, here's the thing. If you find anything, you have to declare it as treasure. Mm-hmm. And I want to do that. I, that's the only step I want to do. I want to find something and I'm going to go, treasure! But anyway, you have to declare it as treasure and hand it over to the crown. Yeah. Now, the crown will take a look at it um, through whatever appraisal methods that they have. I didn't take a look too closely at the law behind this, which is called the English Treasure Act. Mm -hmm. But they will essentially look at it and they will figure out whatever it's worth. And they're not going to cheapskate you on this, apparently. Yeah. I mean, they're going to find out what it's worth. And if it was worth 766,000 pounds, well... You get half of that mm -hmm. as the discoverer and you, you and your team. You have to share mm -hmm. with your team probably. And then the landowner, because there's probably no public land in England, I would imagine. Right. Because there is no public land because any public land is actually crown land. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's no BLM over there in yeah. England. But anyway, the other half goes to the crown. Right. And it sounds like they keep the artifact, probably put them in the British Museum you know, blah, 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 whatever they're going to do. Well, I think you, they can sell them to whoever they want. It's just that whatever. No, they get compensated for them. I don't think they get to keep what they find. Oh. Yeah, they get half the value. The landowner gets half the value. The crown keeps everything. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, because gotcha. it's national history. Yeah. yeah. OK, so I gotcha. Yeah, that's that's my sense of it anyway. Well, it seems pretty fair to me. I don't know why anybody would subvert that law. I guess they want more than fifty well, percent. Because why take three hundred and thirty-three thousand pounds when you could take seven hundred and sixty-six? I know <laughs> that's not actually but... good math, but I didn't do it really quickly in my head. <laughs> I was I was accounting for taxes. That's what I was oh, doing. okay, okay, gotcha. Because <laughs> I'm sure you have to pay taxes. I'm on sure it. you have to pay taxes, so I guess that would be another hit if you declare it legally. But yeah, gosh, I don't know. I just it seems like the risk is not worth it to me. But I'm I'm pretty risk averse, so. That's me. Yeah. Well, there's more to this story. I want to talk first about how they were found, though. 
because it's kind of it's kind of fun. This one guy, the older guy who was like 78, Roger Pilling. Mm-hmm. I think it's Pilling, P I L L I N G. He was arrested at home. He had 41 coins there. He was just at home. They went there, they got him. But they probably knew about him because they arrested Craig Best first. He's 46 years old and he actually thought he was meeting with a metals expert employed by a broker working for a wealthy U.S.-based buyer mm-hmm. when it was actually a detective. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of on to these guys. Yeah, they and had they, been tipped off somehow. Yeah, they put up a yeah. sting operation. He had three coins on him. Yeah. And he was taken in. He was taken into custody. And at that immediately point. flipped on Roger. Probably. Poor old Roger. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, don't forget about Roger. Yeah. Oh, I only have three yeah. coins. You want the other 41? Talk to my man, Roger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No honor among thieves. I guess not. (laughs) Oh, after the trial, they were also convicted on separate charges of possessing criminal property thought to be part of another larger undeclared find known as the Herefordshire Hoard. And that's where these coins actually come from. Oh, Yeah. So these coins, again, were thought to be from this larger collection that was found. Actually, I believe it was in 2019. I I don't think I wrote that down, but I think it was in 2019 and or, or before then. And four others have already been convicted in connection with Mm -hmm. that find in particular. These coins were separated from there and uh, Craig Best and Roger Pilling Mm -hmm. came into possession of them, probably for almost nothing Mm -hmm. because they're trying to sell them for a lot. Well, that's Heist 101 right there. You got to split up the hoard when you're trying to to launder it. (laughs) I know. They should have learned from the Vikings. (laughs) So anyway, the cool thing about this is, and the reason why you really should declare these kinds of things, is they're actually talking about, I mean, literally rewriting some parts of the history books about this. Yeah. Uh, because some of the coins that were found were extremely rare examples of what they call two-headed coins, mm-hmm. showing Alfred of Wessex, who was a king, mm-hmm. king of Wessex, mm-hmm. and Seawolf II, who was actually a king of Mercia. Okay. And all these are little areas they're, within the United Kingdom right yeah, there, on the yeah. island of Great Britain. Mm-hmm. And so... The early Anglo-Saxon writers kind of pictured Seawolf II as a Viking puppet ruler. He was seen as a Viking sympathizer. You know, he was just like beholden to the Vikings, did whatever they want. And Alfred was seen as the great leader that fought off the Vikings. Mm -hmm. But this coin, you don't put two people's heads on a coin. On the same coin, yeah. If they're not in cahoots with each other. Right. Either economically or strategically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they say economically. And they say economically because it's a coin. Yeah. Yeah. If you represent two different kings on a coin. That must mean something was going on there to, yeah. to bring some sort of alliance together. So it's given Seawolf some cred then, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why things like this are incredibly important. It just makes you wonder how much stuff is out there that could shed light on some yeah. of the things that we, you know, take as take as the truth because of the evidence that we have, mm-hmm. but we don't have other evidence to really, you know, fix this. Yeah, that's that's super frustrating. And it's why looting is something that I feel like every government everywhere is always trying to stop it from happening because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it is it is essentially a form of looting when you choose not to declare a horde like this in, in the UK. You right. know, it's not quite the same, but it kind of is. It's like under cover of night going in and digging something up or whatever. That's how you get your hands on stuff like this. And But just have a thought in your brain about what the impact to history and what we know about it might be if the things that you're, you know, stealing away... And not yeah. letting enter into the realm of knowledge for all humans. You take, you're taking that away from everybody yeah. when you do that. Well, ultimately, I've got more faith in the British legal system because <laughs> they were sentenced on May 4th on Star Wars Day <laughs> to be. They were both sentenced to five years and two months in jail. Okay. And probably like most sentencing, I don't know if they'll get out early on good behavior or something like that or if they really yeah. have to do that. I, it doesn't say whether or not they had to pay anything. But they were definitely sentenced. And it just strikes me as odd. I mean, you're trying to sell some, you know, 1,200-year-old coins, 1,300-year-old coins that honestly only a few people really care about Mm -hmm. and are impacted by, and then some history books. Whereas in this country, you can get convicted of all kinds of things and keep living on your resort in Florida and nobody's going to say anything. (laughs) So, you know, it's just, it's interesting how that works out. Yeah, it is. It's Not speaking of anyone in particular. No, it's a little bit of a double standard, maybe, depending on who you are and what kind of money you have, but it is, I mean, at least they did get some kind of sentence for it. It, and again, I'm like, it's just not worth it. You're going to spend five years in jail for making no money. Like you got no profit off of this. There was no, well, I guess unless they sold some stuff previously that didn't get uncovered in the investigation. So maybe they did. I guess we don't know, but it sure just doesn't seem like the risk is worth it. Just turn it over to the crown. Y'all like, let them have it. They'll give you some money. 
you go on your merry way. It's really the best way. You know, the trial happened in Durham, which I don't know anything about where that's at. All I know is it's not London, no. which means Durham is probably a smaller place mm-hmm. because London's huge. And the only reason I'm going there is because does that mean Roger and Craig have to serve their sentence in a prison near Durham? Because I'm just like, what does an English prison even look like? They, do they have tea time? Do they get biscuits? <laughs> look, I yelled like, at you about this the other night. <laughs> Not all British people are like high society, pinkies in the air, you know, with the super fancy accent. I there, guarantee. There is a range of different people in that country. I guarantee there's tea time in British prison. Well, maybe, but I'm, I don't think that all the people in prison and are nice. <laughs> so I'm not saying they're nice, but they get their tea. <laughs> they might they might shank you for it, but you know <laughs> they might shank get, you for a biscuit <laughs> and a tea. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Oh my gosh, you're ridiculous. Like, I'll give you these cigarettes for your tea. <laughs> I can't even with you. Oh man. Uh, my next my, my gang name would be English Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Earl Grey over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you. <laughs> Earl Grey hot. <laughs> It's gone off the rails. We need to end this one. All right. Time to edit. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.arcpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Come.